long considered the doyen of Carroll studies, Morton Cohen on my left has written or edited among innumerable scholarly works, the letters of Lewis Carroll, Lewis Carroll in the House of Macmillan, Lewis Carroll and his illustrators with Edward Wakeling, and of course, Lewis Carroll, a biography in 1995. He was appointed a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature in 1996. Edward Giuliano is president of the New York Institute of Technology, a known authority on Victorian literature, particularly Dickens, was president of our society for several years in the late 80s, and was instrumental in getting The Wasp in a Wig published. He has also edited compendia of essays, Lewis Carroll Observed, Lewis Carroll A Celebration, and Soaring with the Dodo. Uh, that last publication uh, was exactly 30 years ago when he interviewed Morton Cohen, and we thought it would be interesting to restage that, only this time, what has happened basically in the last 30 years. Um, I now give you four minutes. Thank you, Mark. I've often wondered what happened in the last 30 days. <laughs> um, so we're now into the six impossible things before breakfast portion, but it's really six impossible things before dinner portion of the uh, program. Uh, certainly the 1994 founding of the Lewis Carroll Society uh, and it being here in 2012 is one of those remarkable things. Um, clearly what was very remarkable is in 1962, Morton essentially became the first person ever in academia to study Lewis Carroll. He'd been studying and working on Carroll since 62. Wasn't, you know, of course, it was clear that Carroll was in the fringes of the academy. Uh, we've heard mentioned today of uh, Elizabeth Sewell, uh, William Empson, both British writers who became professors, and both pre-PhD sorts. Um, but starting in 62, Carroll was not in the academy, but by 1982, when we sat down 30, year, 30 years ago to talk, it was very much inside the academy, thanks in part to Morton um, and some other groundbreaking studies. And here we are 30 years after that interview, which you know that's the unbelievable portion that we're here talking 30 <laughs> years later. Um, but to me, what was also unbelievable was the quality of the talks this morning. They were absolutely impossible to, to imagine back in 62 or 82, I think. So my first question is, is uh, what do you think the role or the changes have been in the academy since 62 in 82 to now? Well, uh, I, there has been a distinct and uh, ever-growing interest in Lewis Carroll in the Academy, and it's almost like a, uh, a rolling stone uh, uh, picking up uh, moss all the way and growing bigger and bigger all the time, uh, whereas uh, Lewis Carroll now is, gets into all kinds of courses, and uh, it, it, the number of articles that appear in academic journals as well as, of course, in popular magazines and newspapers all over the world, uh, it's been an avalanche. That's the only way you can really describe it. And it doesn't stop. It increases all the time. So there's a, is there a distinction between Carol's life and works and popularity and perception in academia and then the public perception, his popularity in the mass media? I think there's a healthy overlap there. Um, there are a lot of people uh, who don't understand some of the academic outflow <laughs> uh, because it gets terribly specialized and uh, I involved in all kinds of arcane uh, disciplines. But um, much much of the material that appears in in academic journals is is straightforward, and in Lewis Car in the in in the essence of Lewis Carroll's uh, way of reaching his public, they it, maybe it's contagious. They try to get their work so that it's understood 
generally as well as in in, in academia, yes. I know um, <clears throat> you're going to profess innocence now, because um, I want to talk a little bit about the internet, which uh, didn't exist the last time, or it existed only at universities for non-public consumption back in 1982. But for the last 17 years, it's been a public document, and it's been the, the fastest growing or accepted means of um, communications in the history of the world, so that now, sadly, more people have access to the internet in parts of the world than they do to clean water. Um, so you see the, the use, and I also know you, that I remember the days when you were an early adapter of word processing, walking around with a K, was it K-Pro? K-Pro. K-Pro, <laughs> suitcase, wherever you went. So. Now the internet has changed. We we were in, when you began as an academic studying Carol. There was very little information. Um, you had to go out very hard, long ways to find it and search for it. And now we have too much information because we have to kind of weed through it to find out what's useful or not. So, how do you see the internet affecting either the academic or the popular culture reputation and perception of Carol? Well, it it works for both really. Uh, it gives a place for some academics to uh, publish their work uh, if they can't get them published otherwise. And uh, in the popular, it's, I mean, Lewis Carroll is uh, as common expression, expression as anything is in, anywhere in life, on the internet, all over the place. There are any number of home page, Lewis Carroll home pages. Uh, many of us, without ask, being asked at all, <laughs> our, our whole lives are spread out on the <laughs> internet. <Yes. laughs> uh, and uh, this is going to increase whole books. I mean, you can get, you can, you can, you can read all, all of, almost all of. Uh, uh, Lewis Carroll's work, if not all of Dodson's work yet. On the internet, and listen uh, to it, and I'm yes, yes, and, yes, and listen to, to it too, and see all the amazing productions, the 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 Disney Alice, the uh, all the all the uh, not only plays, but musical plays, television productions, ballets. Uh, symphonies, all of that uh, accessible, um, and uh, you can also reach uh, people also interested in Lewis Carroll much more easily through the internet that you than you could through uh, long distance mail in the old mm -hmm. days. Yes. So um, we're here in 2012. Um, Two hundred years ago, Charles Dickens was born. Two year, two hundred years ago, Robert Browning was born, and I know that because I was asked to speak on each of those subjects at universities this year. So there are a lot of subject, there was a lot of uh, renewed interest, more so in Dickens than in than in Browning, and I got to thinking about what makes some Victorians survive and others not. Um, certainly, uh, when Adam Gottman was talking, he really r raised. Carroll to a pedestal of beyond both of those men, literally. Um, so when I thought about what Browning and Dickens have in, has in, com have in common, and more so uh, applied to other writers, particularly Carroll, what they have in abundance is you know, language, both in uh, the ingenious constructions, and whether it's Carroll's puns or Browning's poetry and phrasings, and language that it's very popular. They're very quotable authors, Dickens, Carol, Browning, uh, and others. Um, they clearly characters, uh, they're unforgettable from, from them. Uh, they both have a modern sense, they all have modern, those who survive have a modern sensibility and modern technique we can point to. Certainly with Carol, we got a little bit of that at the end of the uh, illustrating, illustrations discussion. Um, they all have a sense of melodrama 
in their stories, you know, the battle of good and evil, even if it's in the sentimentality that Gottmik was talking about. And they have a sense of grotesque, too, which came through in the illustrations. Melodrama, grotesque, very Victorian yes. elements. <laughs> yes. Stage and screen adaptations, very popular for the ones who survive. We just saw 1915 or 1928, a combination <laughs> of the two. Um, we also have this 21st century voyeurism in interest in their biographies mm. because whether it's Dickens who lived a Dickensian life and, and Carroll who has a fascinating life and, and even Browning who had a, an interesting life and, and one of the great love stories of literature. But there's one more thing that, I, that they have in common um, which is popular, uh, promotional interest groups. That's us. So let's talk about societies and their role in the advancing of a, of a literary figure, because we're here at the Lewis Carroll Society of North America, founded in 1974. As we said, the British Society was founded just a few years before that. Um, but that's well before 1962 when you started. Remember, Browning was the most popular poet of the times by, in his last decade of his life, mm -hmm. thanks to the founding of the Browning Society in London by Frederick Furnival. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and there's a rapid growth of Browning societies all over the world. The New York Browning Society, in fact, still exists. But my question is twofold. You know, what influence do you think that the Carroll societies have had on Carroll's position in society today? I mean, popular culture is huge, but and we're small, but there's now Carroll societies in Japan and in, and in Brazil. Um, and then I want to ask a second part of that is, uh, what should the Lewis Carroll Society of North America be, do, uh, be doing to prevent uh, a browning out <laughs> um, to borrow a pun from my friend August Imholz. So two questions. The role of societies as promotional vehicles for making an author uh, more uh, well-known and ap appreciated, and two, what should we do as a society to perpetuate ourselves? Well, uh, let me begin by talking about the society from the beginning as we we have both been around <laughs> since the beginning. Uh, when, it start, when it started, it was a, it was a small group uh, and uh, ambitious group, I think. And they were eager and they were willing to work Young. hard. <laughs> Younger. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I can remember uh, uh, meetings and all, but think of 30 years of semi-annual meetings all over the United States. Staggering enterprise, really, and all of it successful. All of it involved people who were not only knowledgeable, but generous and eager and, and <laughs> determined to volunteer and give their time and, and give, do anything they could to, to keep the society uh, growing because it was growing all the time. Think of the night weather, which was a couple of pages when <laughs> we, when it began. Now, the night letter, every issue of it is large enough to fill a book. That's staggering. Uh, and think of the people who who work on that and 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 make it as successful as it is. And besides the night letter, how about the publications the, uh, the society has, has brought into being? Right from the beginning, or almost from the beginning, we now have four volumes of the collected Lewis Carroll pamphlets, which is, is an unbelievable accomplishment, thanks to Fran Abley's and her efforts with that project. And there's more to come on that. It's not finished. And well, think uh, the Imholtz, um, Sylvie and Bruno uh, bibliography, uh, 
to uh, well, let's see uh, it, uh, the, um, the the volume of obit uh, Lewis Carroll obituaries, uh, the, the uh, um, Elizabeth uh, Sewell. Eliz Sewell's voices from France, um, uh, the 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 bouquet for the gardener, the Martin Garden Memorial volume, and a whole plethora of pamphlets and and keepsakes and, and what have you. It just is, it really is an astonishing uh, accomplishment. And they're going strong, which is, and better all the time, which is just wonderful, undertaking new projects, new publications, new adventures. It's, it's amazing. Celebrations. <laughs> We have 2015 coming up. Now, now, what about the future? Well, they were in, of course, they're in the internet now. They're, they're bringing new generations to be interested in Lewis Carroll and into the, into the Lewis Carroll Society, which is very important. And I am confident that um, the society will carry on and achieve even greater heights than it has up to now. Um, I'd like to stick with the Carroll Society just for one more minute because um, since the founding of the Society, I think the membership is, well, the, certainly the members who come to meeting fall into sort of four categories. You know, one are the scholars, the academicians. Uh, another group are serious collectors. Uh, a third group are artists whether they be actors or directors or graphic artists or illustrators. They're all, everybody I'm saying is in the room in one form or another. And then we might have the fourth group that you might call aficionados in the best sense of uh, the 19th century amateur, mm -hmm. um, the armchair scholars and, or enthusiasts. And of course, you can belong to more than one class in that. Um, but there's no denying the collectors. We that for us was yes. was uh, you, know, a, you know a crutch at, literally in building the society. So I want to know which, what your thoughts are on the contribution that the collectors have made to scholarship and your work. And again, if you want to extrapolate to modern popularity as well. So role of collectors in Carol's reputation. Well. Uh, for one, I couldn't have done the work I did without the cooperation of the, the large Lewis Carroll collectors in the world. And uh, uh, fortunately, I had a small credential, you know, I'm still be making my way in, in, in the academic world, but I had published uh, two or three books already, so the, I wasn't a novice, and people listened to me. and and usually tested me and took me out to lunch and s to find out what kind of a person I was and all of that. And without that kind of cooperation, uh, I couldn't have done the work I did. In fact, uh, there were uh, a couple of, uh, of uh, big collectors who refused to g allow me to uh, examine their collections. Uh, but fortunately, before even before I published the two-volume edition of the letters, they crumbled <laughs> and uh, and came round. <laughs> so it's uh, very important. I mean, collectors are very important. They are usually rich. They have the the money to buy all the best Lewis Carroll items, and they also are uh, they keep. They keep this, the the collection in in good shape. They know how to do that, and I'm personally very grateful. And as I'm sure other Lewis Carroll uh, writers who benefit from uh, using collectors' material feel the same way, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, okay. Well, there's there's obviously in this room collectors who. Um, collect information as well that's assisted along the way. But I, I want to go back, uh, come try, I'll come back to collections and collectors, but let's go back to Victorian Oxford for a minute. And uh, let me ask you a question about the man, 
Charles Ludwig Stotts. And I know you used to dismiss the notion of uh, Carol Hargrave's claim that Dodson wanted to marry his mother, Alice Liddell, but you little, you changed your mind 30 years ago. Um, and in fact, in the interview we did 30 years ago, um, you talked about changing your mind in those 30 years. Are you more convinced or less convinced? Uh, I'm more convinced, and I'd like to explain. It, it's not much of, um, uh, uh, well, I'll uh, make it short. Um, indeed, uh, I was um, quite sure about Lewis Carroll's uh, romantic attachment, shall we say, to Alice and deep-seated desire, I think, to marry her sometime. I think I, I felt that having read all the letters and having had suddenly uh, the uh, access to the entire Lewis Carroll set of diaries, even when they were still in manuscript. Uh, I read, reading that, them, the, uh, those diary, those volumes, certainly uh, I came to the absolute conclusion that there's no question about his wanting that. Uh, but there was, there's more. Uh, in, um, in, oh, a few years ago, th four or five years ago, um, Alice's granddaughter decided to um, sell the family, uh, her grandmother's uh, effects. And a lot of letters, a lot of uh, uh, d uh, diary material, uh, uh, artifacts, artworks, all, everything. And Sotheby's got up a big catalog for the auction. And because I was asked to write the introduction to the catalog, uh, I made it sure that I would have access to all those papers, <laughs> which I did have. And I found a number of things that I surreptitiously copied um, uh, that, uh, that were, were new to me and uh, rather uh, interesting. One in particular was a letter from Lorena, Alice's older sister, a letter from Lorena to Alice when they were both old ladies. Florence Becker Lennon, the early biographer, biographer of Lewis Carroll, came to see Lorena and asked poignant questions. Uh, one question she asked was, what was the reason for the break between Carroll and the little family in 1863, June 1863. And uh, uh, Lorena answered what she thought she should answer. And then she sat down and wrote to her sister Alice, reporting the visit from Mrs. Lennon in this way, glasses. Um, this is a passage from that letter. Uh, I told her his manner became too affectionate to you as you grew older and that mother spoke to him about it as one had to find some reason for all intercourse season, ceasing. Mr. Dodson used to take you on his knees. I did not say that. Um, what she, what else she did not say is in a way implicit there. Um, there's, there's, she's holding back a lot uh, of material. And when you, you know, you get something like that and you think about other things that, um, that appear, have appeared in letters and in diaries, you make other connections, and here is a connection I made. Uh, it's a letter that Lewis Carroll wrote to Mrs. Little when he was an older man. Uh, I, I should I, I say that uh, that break occurred, and for six months Lewis Carroll was not 
welcome at the deanery. And he himself says that he kept apart from the little family for those six months. And then in December of 63, he got, did get an invitation to go back to the deanery and, for, uh, and uh, relationships took up again, but very formal and, uh, and very proper. No, 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 none of the closeness that had uh, been the case earlier. And here is the letter that Lewis Cowell writes uh, uh, on November 19th, 1891. If I were 20 years younger, he writes to Mrs. Little after asking would Mrs. Little allow the two younger little daughters, Rhoda and Violet, to come over to his rooms for a visit? Uh, he's requesting that. And he says, if I were 20 years younger, I should not be bold enough to give such invitations, but I am close to 60 years now, and all romantic sentiment has died out of my life. Now, you put those things together, and a few others, which I, I'm sparing you. Um, <laughs> Don't. <laughs> <laughs> you have to come to some conclusion, and especially when you know... All right, one other thing I should say. When you know that when that break occurred, it was just at a, a critical time when the Prince of Wales and his, bri his new bride had come to Oxford. The Prince of Wales was uh, an undergraduate at Christchurch, and he brought his bride to his undergraduate college, stayed at the deanery while they were there, and uh, Oxford just broke up try celebrating this remarkable royal visit. And of course, marriage, marriage, marriage was in the air, and marriage was in the air, and suddenly there was the break because of something that Lewis Carroll did or said that was some afternoon. He wrote all about it himself in his diary. Unfortunately, we don't have it. His niece, a proper Victorian uh, spinster lady, cut it out of the diary, and we have never seen it. Lewis Carroll wouldn't have cut it out. He, he was ready to come forth with all that was true about him. He wasn't hiding anything, but we don't have that, uh, that page. But certainly it goes beyond just a good, sweet friendship. Uh, clearly he 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 might have said he said he might even have said something jokingly, or one of the girls might have said to Alice, "Whom are you going to marry?" The prince was here. She's a lovely lady, his wife. Who are you going to marry, Alice, when you grow up? As she might say, "I'm going to marry Mr. Dodson." Bang. <laughs> uh, anything is possible, but marriage is part of it. Um. Well, you've just demonstrated why you are the authority and the keeper of knowledge about Lewis Carroll. Um, you published a, a two volume letters in 1979. Um, when we were interviewing 30 years ago, I noted that in your preface, you said you had collected many uh, more letters, and the edition that came out clearly favored the letters that were to the child friends and more or less designed for a broader audience. And then you came out with some, um, some more specialized collection uh, of collections subsequently. But what about the other letters? And what are your thoughts about the future well, of the still unpublished letters? Yes. Well, uh, things take time, you know. <laughs> there, was, there were three uh, additional volumes during those 30 years. And the, uh, there was also the volume of... Uh, collected letters, uh, not collected, so selected letters. Mm -hmm. And I did another volume I thought I had to take the time to do, interviews and recollections, uh, apart from a good many other things. And I'm still now in the middle of another volume, the letters to his, uh, uh, to uh, Henry Savile Clark, uh, mm -hmm. the playwright mm -hmm. who produced um, uh, the first uh, Alice on the Stage, that very popular 
play, uh, musical play, which is still being produced to this day. Uh, and I'm about halfway through, but life intrudes so much. Uh, and it's, uh, there are so many things uh, that ha have to be done. Uh, and um, it's uh, terrible. When I was teaching at the university, I had two secretaries who wouldn't let me make a phone call or, 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 or do anything with the Xerox machine. And they typed all my letters and even tried to take care of my personal life. Mm -hmm. and, and then I retired, and here I am having, having to Xerox my own Xeroxes and make my own phone calls and, uh, uh, and do and my own shopping. <laughs> life is tough, Morton. I don't know. <laughs> So. It takes time, but but uh, there is this vo volume in in the works. There is another. Um, there's a, a, a group of letters that came in after, largely came in afterwards. A very large group, and uh, th there's a plan for getting that into a a supplemental volume someday. There is also still another volume of Lewis Carroll and his letters to the press and hmm. to certain letters that he circulated in, in his circular letters. And all the material is gathered. I've gathered all that, you see. It just takes time. So let, and... me, let me just ask a, a, a yes, direct question. So how many, you know, all, of all the letters that you've collected information on, how many have been published and how many have not been published? Oh, a percentage. Dear. I could only guess at that. Um, well, th there were 1,300 letters in the two-volume edition, and I would say that there were certainly uh, certainly that much more, maybe more than 1,300 in the three volumes that came out in the last 30 years, and there are probably. There have probably been 1,500 to 2,000 letters. So, so if we do the math, then you have to promise to keep editing for at least another 30 years. <laughs> okay? Not very likely. <laughs> but we'll try to see that everything uh, uh, gets turned over in the right direction. And what I can't do, some I hope some other able scholar will. Well, that's the, the, the logical transition in your life and in the, in the natural order of things is going from being uh, the editor of letters to being a biographer, um, which you did take that big leap once. And uh, we talked a little bit about the responsibilities of a, of a biographer and uh, how has, and I'm curious about how Carol's been treated. Uh, do you think, as a biographer, especially by previous ones, yourself, but now the ones who have been subsequent to your biography? So, uh, and the follow up question to that is will we ever going to get academics in the popular culture to forget about this obsession with Lewis Carroll's biography and the f fallacious biography? <laughs> yeah, there. Uh... That's the only reason I wrote the biography is that I uh, there was a biography that came out at one point I won't mention which uh, and uh, uh, I was having dinner with a friend who was interested and he said uh, what did you think of it the the new biography which I, of course I had just read and I said well the biographer doesn't know Lewis Carroll. <laughs> and I guess I couldn't say anything more damning than that. And he said, well, then you must write the biography. It's as simple as that. And um, I went home, my, mid, my mind spinning with all the work on my plate already. Uh, now another biography. Fortunately, I had written biography before, so the, the task of writing, I, I mean, I knew how to do it. Uh, and, and I slept on it a little while, but then I decided I just really did have to do it, and I did it. It was as simple as that.
but there have been more biographies since yours, whether it's, you know, Ann Clark or uh, the Caroline Leach episode and others. Yes. So has it been treated well? Biography is a form of interpretation. We've got some pretty wild interpretations out there. So is, is it going to be a, a subsequent? You, did you say it all in your volume or we're going to get a supplement in 25 years? <laughs> well, I haven't read much that negates what I did. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, I'm very lucky that that's the case, I suppose. Uh, and uh, I welcome more biographical studies on Lewis Carroll because you never know when you're going to hit more revelations, mm -hmm. uh, either factual or uh, through connections or what have you. Um, and I do keep track of them. And uh, I wish the, any other biographers that come along all the luck in the world. I'm not going to do more biographical work on Carol, obviously. Um, just want to mm. stick with some manuscripts and letters for a second, because I'm just curious about, uh, you know, do you think we're missing manuscript material? There seems not to have been very much Carol manuscript material available. We have some juvenilia, mm. but how uh, everybody yeah. else we find lost this, lost that manuscripts, first draft, second drafts, etc. Yes, well, we have some. We mustn't under uh, underrate this. We, Lewis Carroll's life is a well documented mm. life, and we do have some. Uh, I published. Uh, what, four essays, undergraduate essays of his uh, manuscripts uh, uh, survive, and other things like that, uh, the Wasp and the Wig, uh, and many other, other things do survive. But they were all very careless. The Victorians were all very careless about manuscripts. Once the manuscript got into a book, out it went. I mean, I, I don't know for a fact that Lewis Carroll ever dumped a manuscript into the wastebasket, but something like that. Certainly, his publishers very likely did. Uh, they, kept, they kept most of his letters, not all of them, but most of his letters. Uh, Harry Furness, the illustrator, when he got a letter from Lewis Carroll and Lewis Carroll was suggesting that he make a, a change to a picture, snipped the, the paragraph where Lewis Carroll writes uh, about what he wants on the picture, and he threw the rest of the letter in the wastebasket. We know that for a fact. Uh, and uh, that's the way they behaved. And that's, that's why, why we I have, do emails, actually. Yeah. I just cut and paste, you know, oh, comments yeah. and throw but, the rest away. But, that's that's what we're up against, uh, but uh, but we should be grateful for what we do have. I, I keep saying yes. So uh, we're getting close to the end. So maybe one or two more questions. So there had to be uh, over the past thirty years work that you've done on Carol or interactions that personally affected you. Well, I've had some remarkable experiences, you can imagine. Um, uh, well, let me tell a, a couple of nice things. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was invited at uh, one point to, uh, to address the Friends of the Bodleian Library in Oxford at, uh, in the Radcliffe Camera, grand thing with with dons in their uh, gowns and uh, and the uh, the chancellor of the university in his robes, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I of course accepted and wrote a talk to, to be given, which I had in a briefcase beside me. The chancellor got up and in his robes and introduced the, the treasurer's secretary, who rose and and reported that there's so much money in the kitty and there are uh, so many me new members and uh, stuff like that and sat down and then the chancellor rose again and said to the audience and now we have morton cohen and he sat down <laughs> well I, I 
I dug into my briefcase for my talk and I stumbled up to the uh, 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 to the front and 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 g gave the talk. Of course, I composed myself. But then there was a reception afterwards, and I, I saw a friend, uh, Kathleen Tillotson, a good mm -hmm. friend of mine at that time, and we were chatting, and she said, "Morton, you you seemed nonplussed when the chancellor in, uh, asked you to give your talk." I said, "Well, Kathleen, usually one is introduced." She said, oh, not in Oxford, Morton. If, if you have to be introduced, you're not asked. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing, um, oh, a very high, a nice high point was during the, we haven't even mentioned it, the 1998 uh, commemoration uh, of Lewis Carroll's death. Uh, lots, lots going on. I was flying all over the world, um, giving lectures and interviews for that. But one, uh, one of the things that happened was that the, was it the BBC or ITV wanted to film something on a, a books program of theirs at the British Library with, with the Lewis, Car the original Lewis Carroll diaries. Well, I chose the diary that contained the day of the the river trip and i opened it to that page and i held it in my hand while the cam cameras were worrying and then and i talked about it in, in and showed the page and that appeared on on the television and that was very that was i was very gratified about that and the only other thing uh, that I think uh, worth really uh, mentioning is what you've already alluded to, and that is in 1996 coming, I came back from my summer in uh, in in London, uh, having worked there all summer, and was ready to go back to uh, to teach, you know, not teaching or back to work. In any case, there was a, a large brown envelope, uh, as though it were. <laughs> Uh, uh, some kind of advertisement, and I ripped it open, and it was uh, from London, London, and it was it began um, uh, at at the pleasure of the Queen. Uh, we wish to appoint you a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. Well, I thought it was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, American. A, a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, it doesn't ha it doesn't happen. I, I, it has does happen. I've now learned that there are two or three others uh, Americans in there as well. But of course, I uh, once I got over the shock of it, I gladly accepted <laughs> and have been going to those glorious meetings uh, every year. Uh, the one great thing about the, the great moment of that is when you are in, inducted. They bring out once a year in the middle of June meeting the register of fellows. They open it up at the page. It's a great big thick thing. It goes back to King George III, you see, uh, who invented the uh, Royal Society of Literature. And you go up, you're summoned up to write your name in the register. And you get a choice of writing your name with either Lord Byron's pen, ivory pen, or Charles Dickens's plume yeah, pen. And I'm sorry to say I chose <laughs> Byron's, Byron's All pen. been downhill since then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I'd like to end by the sa with the same question, more or less, that I asked back in 1982. Um, in summary fashion, again, what do you see the next 20 years for Carol's life and studies and popularity? And for that matter, what do you see for the next 50 years, be in your crystal, 150 years in your crystal ball? 20 years, 150. How's that for a framework? Yeah. Well, the way the way uh, technology is changing our lives and the way the world is shrinking 
uh, and so much is different every year, every few years. It's really impossible to predict. But one thing I'm, I'm sure of, uh, I, I couldn't believe the, the, the rate at which Carol's popularity was snowballing and increasing all through these years. Um, these these contemporary children reading Alice. Alice is a book, a Victorian story with all the Victorian language and all the arcane illusions and Victorian dress and Victorian speech. How do they manage with that? And yet they do manage with it because there's genius behind all that. And that, I'm sure, is going to go on and on and on. And Lewis Carroll will grow and, and really produce a lot of pleasure and happiness for people. And that, to me, is a very valuable uh, course to expect. Well, I think on that note, I think we should thank Lewis Carroll and Morton Cohen. Thank you, Morton. <laughs>